um, we're dealing with our book of the week and it's Anthony Murphy, author from Drogheda, former newspaper editor and journalist. And, uh, good morning to you. Welcome to the programme. Hello Paul, thank you for having me. Not at all. Now the stone engravings at Newgrange, um, we're going to deal with the whole thing of Newgrange and all the theories and the like down through the year. They have, I mean, it's, it's true to say they've baffled experts for centuries as to their entire meaning. There have been literally dozens of books written on this subject. Uh, authors of their own theories about the meaning of the, the, I suppose, the mysterious symbols carved into stonework, and now another book. And I don't mean that to uh, sort to sound like, oh no, not another book, but you've always been fascinated by Newgrange, and you spent a considerable amount of time researching the monument, um, I suppose, a, a number of years. So where does this interest in Newgrange actually come from? I mean, there have been quite a number of books and TV uh, programmes and radio programmes on it. Yeah, I suppose, well, well, the fascination was driven by, uh, I suppose, a couple of things. One is that I've always studied astronomy, which is, you know, the stars, and ever since I was young, I, I, I've been interested in astronomy, and the fact that Newgrange is astronomically aligned has always interested me. Um, I think I was just naturally interested anyway, because they're on our doorstep. I mean, they're only five miles out the road, the monuments, you know, and they're probably the best examples of what archaeologists call passage tombs in Europe, really, not just in Ireland. Um, but really what set this whole thing in train was when myself and Richard Moore hooked up in 1999 and started researching because he was very interested in mythology and wanted to become, we wanted to learn about the astronomy and I was very interested in the astronomy and wanted to learn more about the mythology and it just kind of took off from there. We wrote a book together, uh, Island of the Set and Sun and basically this is, it's like a follow on but you mentioned there, so one of the difficulties with Newgrange is that it, it's over 5,000 years old. So apart from the actual monument and whatever bits and pieces, fragments of um, remains that archaeologists dig up, um, we and the carvings that are on the stones, we, we don't have anything... We don't have a st- historical documents to tell us what it's about, why it was built. We have to interpret. That's why there's been so many interpretations of Newgrange. We're forced to interpret because we have so little to go on. Um, to me, the monuments always made sense in terms of the cosmology and the astronomy and the alignments. And I think that Newgrange is much more complex than uh, a solar alignment. I think there's a lot more astronomy involved at Newgrange than is popularly made out. In actual fact, in prehistoric times, if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to abide by a calendar, a solar calendar is pretty much useless. And I say that in the book because if you're going by the reference of the sun, I'm sure, how, how do you know what day of the year it is by looking at the sun? You can tell exactly what time of the year it is by looking at the moon and at the backdrop of the moon against the stars, where the stars are, where some of the planets are, uh, where the sun is in relation to the zodiac. Um, so their calendar was much more complex. So that's one of the things that really got me hooked on this. There's a lot of interpretation in the new book uh, of mythology, because I think mythology has meaning. Some of it is scientific and some of it, well, some of it's just timeless. There's a timeless aspect to mythology and folklore uh, from the Boyne Valley that actually resonates today. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're dealing with a time in his in prehistory where human beings had taken the first steps out of the forests of the Mesolithic, where we, we had this... Uh, what we call the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. We basically chased everything that we had to eat and fished it in the water and picked it from trees. And that was the lifestyle that we had lived for maybe tens of thousands of years. And all of a sudden, we left the forest and we started farming. We started sowing crops and we started keeping cattle. And that was the revolution that the Neolithic brought. It also brought a revolution in how we lived our lives with more time. I say we, I'm talking about humanity, obviously. We had more time to do things, and one of those things was the construction of these monuments, which were both scientific devices and shrines to spiritual beliefs. Where does it fit into the whole Druid thing? I mean, I, I would know an awful lot Not about... Not mention Druids in the book. D- that's a very controversial subject, you see. There's a tendency... That's why I ask. Yeah. Because I, I, you hear you know, you know, hear about it, the, the summer solstice and all that, and you hear about it once a year, and the Druids, and yeah. they will gather there. So where does Newgrange actually... Why do they flock to that one particular place? Well, there's a tendency to link... Uh, you know, Newgrange and Stonehenge with Druids. Now, we don't really... I, I, I think Druids were much later than Neolithic, but the thing is, we don't really know who the chiefs of the tribe were or the community. We don't know whether they were priests or shamans or Druids or what they were. We can't really say for certain. Um, 
New, this is one of the big themes of the book is the continuing rise in fascination with ancient sacred sites and you touched on the druids there because I mentioned you know all of the sorts of people that flock to Newgrange especially at the time of the solstice who would include you know pagans and witches and you know new agers and people into all sorts of spirituality but I think there's a reason for that part of the part of the reason for that is there's a very large vacuum now in society I mean one of the things that I touch upon and I think it's very important to, to say it is that as the traditional church has lost its grip and as people kind of move away from Catholicism as we were once kind of married to it um, and as the church has become dogged by scandal and as our political and economic institutions have failed us it's no surprise that over the last 10, 15, 20 years that there's a huge growth in interest in prehistoric sites Newgrange is one of them the Hill of Tara is another there are other sites around the country to which people are flocking in greater numbers and they're looking people are trying to wind back the clock to look at something from the past that seems to have worked or seems to resonate to make sense to them and that's one of the messages of the Newgrange book is the idea of Newgrange having a, an eternal message for us it's not just relevant for the time that the farming astronomer community who built it but it's actually relevant as much today as it was then what would be the most revealing chapter in the book if you were to sit down and flick through it um, I think uh, you see I uh, the reason I've said immortality in the title monument to immortality I think one of the biggest things that I explore is maybe the spiritual aspect and the mystical aspect of Newgrange now I know that some people are turned off by that I understand that I've given some of the archaeological and historical uh, history of Newgrange but um, the, the reason it turns people off I think sometimes is because they do think that you know there's all sorts of you know new agers who do all sorts of dancing and chanting and maybe taking drugs and all that sort of stuff I, I, I'm, I'm not really going in that direction I think that um, the most the biggest probably single thing about this book is the idea that the people who built Newgrange um, understood that or were the first to express a belief monumentally that the soul actually survives physical death and ventures to another world. You see, if you look at Newgrange and Nouth and Douth and the mythology about them, the mythology says that the gods of the two headed Danon, who are immortal, entered the other world by going into the mounds, right? And that they can float between this world and the next using the mounds. They're portals, they're liminal, they're sacred spaces that represent an entry to this sacred other world this other world was known in old Irish mythology as Tiernan Oak as we all know from our, our folklore the land of youth Tiernan Mio was another name for that it means land of the ever living ones Mag Mel the plain of happiness we have all these descriptions of a mythical magical other world the most revelatory aspect of it for me was the chapter about the near death experience as an Irish writer, Colin Keane has written a couple of books in recent uh, years, in the past couple of years, dealing with Irish people who've had near-death experiences, people who've died and been brought back to life. And in 95% of cases where somebody has died and their body is physically dead, their conscience seems to survive that physical death and has a, a tremendous experience. Part of this experience, 95% of those people describe either floating down a dark tunnel and towards a brilliant light or both you know either the tunnel and the light or in in many cases both and that's what Newgrange essentially does it replicates this other world journey I mean the archaeologists tell us their belief is that this, the bones of the deceased were placed in sacred bowls in the chamber and that somehow maybe the light of the solstice sun coming in may have you know brought out the souls to the other world and that's present there in the mythology of Newgrange but it's actually inherent in the design of the monument as well. There's this dark tunnel leading towards the brilliant light which seems to enhance or somehow replicate this journey to the other side. And the mythology suggests it as well. So I suppose, as I said, we are dealing in the realm of interpretation. So I want to make it clear to people that this isn't designed to be a textbook and the answer to all the questions. It's an interpretation. If we were to come at it, or if I was to come at it from another angle, how likely is it that, because I mean, as, as you know, humans, you know, it's our nature to be curious, but how likely is it that we're actually um, exaggerating the complexity of this? Maybe it's a purely more simplistic thing. That, I mean, it's not as complex as we would like to think it is. Maybe we're actually not looking, we're looking too far rather yeah, than... Yeah, there's plenty back. of people out yeah. there who will read certain sections of the book and they'll probably slap themselves in the head and go, oh, I can't believe he said that. Because 
you know, I, I talk about the idea that some people have that, you know, I think we do box these people into a primitive box. And I think that we've more in common with them than we could ever realise. I do think that there's a deficiency in our explanation of how they built the monuments. And we don't know where they lived, for instance. Apart from a few houses that were found, the foundations of houses that were found during the digging at Nouth, we don't actually know where the community that built Newgrange lived. And uh, one significant aspect of this is Connor Brady has had a big input into some of the archaeological stuff in the book. And, you know, Connor kind of really gave me an impression of how regional the scale of the project was, that it wasn't just people living in the immediate Boyne Valley that built the monuments. There may have been people involved from Wicklow, where the quartz came from, the Cooley Peninsula, where some of the uh, granite came from, and Clotterhead, where the large kerbstones came from, and they were supposed to have brought them by boat down the coast and up the river. Um, there's an awful lot of unanswered questions, and I think that, again, I say this in the book, that is one of the wonderful and that's what makes Newgrange mysterious. That's what makes it interesting, because if we had all of the answers and we knew everything, it would cease to be interesting and people would no longer go there. And that's the wonder, one of the wonderful things about examining Newgrange is the fact that so much about it is still mysterious to us, that we genuinely can't answer some of the questions. What we can do, and what myself and Richard Moore did in Island of the Setting Sun, and what I've continued to do in Newgrange, is to interpret what we do know, to look at the monument, its structure, its design, its alignment, its alignment with other monuments, its alignment within the landscape, its mythology, the stories about Newgrange. Could they be Neolithic in origin? Could these stories have been told by the community that built Newgrange? Some of the stories in the Boyne Valley appear to describe the cosmology of the monuments. Now, if that's the case, how could that be if those stories are much more recent than the monument themselves? That's one of the questions that I would always ask and it's one of the questions that no academic will dare to answer because they know they're putting themselves way out on a limb by suggesting that the mythology is actually prehistoric because there's absolutely no evidence that it is apart from when you interpret it and when you interpret it you're going to go outside the realms of uh, well you're going you're falling outside the realms of academia really and that's the one advantage that someone like me has i'm just an amateur astronomer writer researcher and um you know i'm i don't have uh, an academic reputation to protect so I am able to interpret and it's an interpretation some people will like it some people won't How long do you think without all the things we have today like earth movers diggers whatever how long would it actually take to construct This is another very interesting question because if it's a hundred people building it yeah. it might have taken them three generations if it was a thousand it might have taken them five years uh, one of the very interesting things that uh, Conor Brady says, and he's quoted in the book, that he believes that uh, Newgrange would have been a seasonal project, that when the agricultural um, activity in the valley was at its most intense, um, that there was no mound building. The mound was built at quiet times in the agricultural year. But you see, again, th the reason we can't answer that is um, the stones came from um, in the case of Wicklow, 70 or 80 kilometres away. So there's clearly a very large regional element to this, which means that the other part of the problem is we can't say what the population of the valley was at the time. You see, we can look and say, look, we, we found X number of flint tools and X number of bits of pottery and X number of, you know, fires or whatever, or other evidence of fire. But, like, you know, one X number of pieces of flint doesn't equal one person. It doesn't work like that, you know. Again, you're down to <laughs> you're down to interpretation. We have no book. And I say this, this is I always love this idea, you know, we've no manual, Newgrange for dummies. You know, how we did it <laughs> by some Stone Age guy writing about well, this is the entire manual yeah. to Newgrange, this is why we did it, how we were inspired and how we built it. We don't have it. So we got to piece the picture together using other means. Just one final question, because um, I'm actually running over a little bit, but um, I, I was told um, that the, the stones are actually dotted around the edges of Newgrange, that they were just put up there. They were found lying around the site, but if they were actually put up in the proper order to, you know, they'd bring on actually some significance, that they, they would have some sort of meaning, but they, they were just put there because they were found and they're part of the site, but we don't actually know how they should be organised. 
Is that true? Or? Oh, you mean the, the quartz? Yes. Yeah, the quartz was found on the yeah. ground, you see, and Professor O'Kelly did experiments. The white where, stones. Yeah, the, where yeah. he showed that they must have been at on the front of the mound at a near vertical. Now, that's currently supported by a concrete wall now. That was rebuilt mm -hmm. during the archaeology. So, you know, obviously there's, a, again, there's an interpretative element there, but that was the best evidence that he had. The stones were found flat on, the, or, well, they were found, they called it the cairn slip. The cairn had slipped out and covered over the, the curb stones. And um, this is a reconstruction. Yeah, you're right. We don't actually know exactly what it looked like when it was built. Again, How what we, we see yeah. today at Newgrange mm -hmm. is an interpretation. So the archaeologists are doing it as well they're interpreting that's all we can do you know um, there's a safety element too you can't bring tourists into a site like Newgrange I mean those stones are fastened on to this concrete wall so that they don't fall on people and hurt them you know that's another aspect to it there's no cases of people trying to gauge them out and bring them home uh, I, well, I was out there taking <laughs> pictures for the book uh, uh, a couple of months ago and I noticed there are one or two missing really yes, yes. how would somebody get away with it how would I they? don't know I don't know maybe they fell out but uh, three people are standing in front of one guy and he's you know, a pen knife you'd or something you'd be surprised what yeah. people are doing. I wouldn't be actually no I, I know yeah. I'd say a lot <laughs> of that quartz probably disappeared over the centuries yeah. there's a lot less there now than there was maybe originally well, the book is called New Grange, Monuments to Immortality. Um, from what I can see, it's a fine publication and is making a lovely uh, Christmas present. And whether somebody has questions about it or they agree with what you're saying, it's going to make an interesting read anyhow. And there's yeah, a few pictures in it. I well. would invite them to contact yeah. me on my website, mythicalireland.com. And the, web, the email address is on there. If you have comments or you have questions, I'd love to hear from you, you know. Okay, that was our book of the week. And Anthony Murphy, thank you very much.